I want to introduce um, a person who joined our team in May. And for many of you, this is David's coming out party. Uh, to our client base and to our, our our group of friends and friends and family. So David G. Brown is the award-winning former CEO of the Greater Omaha Chamber. Uh, in addition to all the accolades um, for him, his chamber also won Chamber of the Year. He's also the past uh, chair of the uh, Amer the Association of Chamber of Commerce Executives. He's very well connected in that chamber and economic development world. And we are so pleased today for his perspective on how to build and pick up on the signals that are gonna help you create the future that you want. David? Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. It's so nice to be here. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure to be with here, here with you and my colleagues. Isn't it exciting that Rebecca's with us today? Her energy is just infectious. And by the way, she's like this all the time. So anyway, I have a unique place on Rebecca's team as both a longtime professional colleague and a former customer. So my part in the chat today is to introduce you to strategic foresight from the customer perspective and to show how communities can create a competitive advantage from change. I'm gonna spend most of my time offering you a real life example of how strategic foresight can take a weak signal, match with a community's commitment to change and turn them into dynamic, exciting and strategic long-term visions for the community or region. But first, just what is a weak signal? You know that feeling you get in the pit of your stomach that tells you something important is in front of you? I used to think it was intuition. You know, that first indication that I was being introduced to something that maybe I should have been aware of a long time ago. Futurists call these unique pieces of information weak signals and have been able to show that if we regularly look for them, it can help us be forewarned of possible changes in the future. By the way, if you want to figure out how to look for signals, we can show you how to do that. Just give us a call. Now, Rebecca has graciously shared a list of prominent weak signals from 2022 in her current newsletter, if you want some examples. But let's look at a real life example to demonstrate how this works in the community. I'm gonna focus on the Omaha 2040 project, which we completed in Omaha when I was the president of the Greater Omaha Chamber of Commerce. So first off, let me set the stage. Picture Omaha in 2015, lots of economic growth, high rankings, low unemployment, new community development projects under construction, and a whole bunch of new ones announced uh, waiting to begin their turn. This happened to be the year that the Omaha Chamber won the uh, Chamber of the Year from ACCE. It was a pretty special year for us. But even then we had ge a genuine concern and that was talent. We were concerned about having very low unemployment and having a very low population growth rates that hovered only around 1% a year. And research was telling us that we were losing more 18 to 34 year olds every year than we were adding. Now this is where our first week signal showed up. First, reports were starting to show up in various places, indicating that the Hispanic population would soon be the fastest growing segment across the country. Early census estimates confirmed that Omaha and Nebraska were going to be experiencing that growth too. Second, we heard more and more anecdotes about companies' difficulty recruiting and keeping black professionals in Omaha. Now we knew that retaining and attracting individuals in that age group was crucial to our future success. And if the early census anecdotal information were accurate, we needed to figure out how to reverse the departure of professionals of color from our region. So we decided to survey our young professionals council members to get some answers. Our YP survey of more than 2,500 young people told us that we had some work to do to make Omaha a vibrant place for young professionals to excel. But even more importantly, the responses said that non-white professionals were six times less likely to recommend Omaha as a place to live or work than their white counterparts. That was alarming. And now we had tangible proof of a problem. We asked the Urban League of Nebraska to work with us on a follow-up survey of its young professional members. And we got even more details and validated the findings of the chamber survey and had even more explicit concerns. We now had a problem that was searching for a solution but we had a new partner in the Urban League, which would be very important down the road. And our YP groups began working together to find answers. By this time, 2017 had rolled around and we were starting the traditional chamber process of building our five-year chamber work plan for 2019 through 2023. Now, at this point, we were using a pretty tra traditional strategic planning process. For the past 20 years, we would look at what we had accomplished in the prior five years. We would then assess it, see what was working and what wasn't working. Uh, we'd eliminate those things that weren't working any longer, uh, bump, pump up those things that were, add some new things on the front side, 
figure out what the budget was going to be, get approval for that budget, then go out and raise the money, implement the strategy and hit all of our goals. And we did that every five years. The problem this year was that when we look back at our accomplishments of the prior five years, we realized that while we were meeting or exceeding all of our micro measures, you know, those things like capital investment, number of jobs, the wages that those jobs paid, the number of projects that we were landing, the number of new startups, um, how we were ranking from a competitiveness perspective or a quality of community perspective, um, we, we couldn't have done it better. We were exceeding all of our goals on those, on those micro measures. However, on our macro measures, those things that were more impactful on the whole, whole region, we found that we were having some challenges in areas of regional prosperity, getting kids ready for college, uh, development across the community and the region, and consistently low unemployment rates. We found these paradoxes that, frankly, I was surprised to see. We were seeing huge amounts of prosperity across the region, but we're also seeing stubborn pockets of poverty across the, the entire place. We saw improved K, K through 12 graduation rates, matter of fact, substantial improval across every demographic. But at the same time, we saw skyrocketing remediation rates in community colleges and first years of four-year colleges. We saw massive development in many areas and expansion all across the county, but in other parts of our region, we weren't seeing anything. And we saw very unemployment across the region, but we still had these stubborn pockets of unemployment in historically lower income areas of our community. A rising tide lifting all boats wasn't working as an underlying philosophy anymore. Instead, we found that parts of the community stagnated while other parts of the community got better and better. We need to do something different other than the strategic planning process we had used over the past 20 years. So I called my friend Rebecca to discuss what could we do differently to get better results? And she introduced me to strategic foresight. Now understand, strategic foresight starts with the premise that you gain a competitive advantage by addressing change and focusing on what you want to be in the future rather than what you were in the past. And there's a process. Very briefly, strategic foresight ensures that a committed and engaged community can develop an exciting vision for the future. In general, the key phases were like this. First, the organization. Who's gonna lead and advocate for this effort? This is not a traditional approach and it's not necessarily a linear process. So commitment and advocacy from the leadership team are absolutely essential to a success. In the Omaha case, the chamber asked the United Way of the Midlands and the Urban League of Nebraska to co-sponsor the process because we anticipated that the vision would be broader that our chamber mission could accommodate. The second phase is the sensing phase. What's happening out there? This is when trends research and environmental scan, including interviews of traditional and non-traditional community and business leaders, reviews of past strategic plans, and surveys of the broader community lead to the identification of significant trends that will likely impact the region over the next 20 years. In the Omaha area, a key finding from this phase, and this is probably the biggest aha moment for us, was that our population across the region will become a majority non-white population by 2040. In 2017, we were a 75% white population, 25% non-white, but we knew that was going to be reversed by the time we got to 2040. That implication, the implications of that finding were just monumental. The third phase is the imagining phase. What could happen? In this phase, hundreds of diverse participants discuss trends in science and technology, education, economy, politics, and then they rank them on the likeliness of that trend happening and the level of the impact of that trend from high to low. The top ranked trends are incorporated into future-based scenarios and common themes or levers are identified that form the foundation for a 20-year vision. In Omaha, that 20-year vision foundation, those levers were people, place, and prosperity. And then the next phase, the defining phase, what do we want to happen and what will it take to get there? In this phase, the visioning, planning, and backcasting from the future vision happens. This is the fun part, where a preferred 20-year vision was created. Omaha 2040 was the Omaha vision, and here's what it looks like and one tool for promoting it. Recording, Greater Omaha Time Capsule Project, November 14, 2040. Today, we are interviewing our first student. Please tell us your name. Amara Williams. Hello, Amara. Hello. How old are you? I'm 10, but my birthday is in February, so I'm basically 11. Please tell the students of tomorrow about Greater Omaha in 2040. What do you like most about living here? Um, there are so many things. 
I love my school. I get to learn about so many different jobs and skills, and we're always using new technology. My teachers want me to dream big, and they say in Omaha, everyone has a chance to reach their dreams. I like that. My mom and dad say I should never settle for good when I can be great. How do you think Omaha compares to other places? I think Omaha is a great place. I get to go on trips with my mom and dad and see lots of other places. But I think Omaha is one of the greatest places in the country. A place where all kinds of people come to live and work really hard and make really cool things. Like music or art or new companies. We're together, you know, one city. But we're all different and that's really neat. What do you see yourself doing in the future? When I grow up, I know I can be whoever I want to be, a robot designer or the boss of a space travel company, and I can do it right here. My mom says Omaha was a really good place when she was my age back in, like, 2017. She says it was because they all tried to not coast and make a better place for all. So I'm not settling for good, because I can be great. That was wonderful, Amara. You are very smart. Yeah, I go to school in Omaha. So Amara is pretty bright, and I think, frankly, it was one of the more fun things we got to do during this vision process is trying to figure out what we were going to do to impact the, the people of the future, particularly children that were just getting into the system. This plan dramatically changed the priorities and measures of success of the chamber. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, transportation, development of the urban core, startups, and internships are just a few examples of some new priority focus areas of the chamber that have already resulted in hundreds of millions of dollars in investment in both private and public and nonprofit type of amenities. Our partners took on some of the goals outside of our mission, but within theirs. And finally, Omaha 2040 became the foundation for everything the chamber took on in the future. You could easily track the rationale for undertaking any new project back to Omaha 2040. If you're curious about the vision, I didn't have time to show it all to you today. You can find it on the Greater Omaha Chamber website at omahachamber.org. Now, as you can see, strategic foresight is a very different process than one that you might be used to. The good news is that we can show you how to do this. Just give us a call. I'm sorry for the shameful plug. Not really. So now let me turn this over to my colleague, Yaz Arakan. She's a futurist with more than a decade of experience, first with the Institute for Alternative Futures, and then with the Rebecca Ryan team. She has worked with local government, nonprofit, engineering, public health, and healthcare organizations to help them look over the horizon so that their decisions today are held accountable to tomorrow. 